Welcome, I'm Joey Baird. And I'm Holly Baird. And we are the founders of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, a website for all levels of gardeners, no matter where you're located at in the world. And today we're gonna to talk about growing potatoes in containers and the ground. Now, how many of you have grown potatoes, or have never grown potatoes before? Any, any newbies? Okay. How many of you have grown potatoes but wish to grow them better? That should be the rest of you, okay. So we're gonna go over the basics. We've Garden, a combination between Holly and myself for 25 years. Some of you may be far beyond that in uh, levels of education. This is what we have found that works best for us, and we hope that it works best for you. So what is a potato? Well, there's a difference between a potato and a sweet potato. A regular potato is a starchy, tuberous crop, and it is from the perennial nightshade family. Other vegetables that are in the same family are eggplant and tomatoes. They're similar all in the, the nightshade family. And the sweet potato is actually a different type of potato, and it's more related to the morning glory family, and it's a larger, uh, sweeter root. So with that being said, Growing potatoes, there's about 5,000 different varieties of potatoes in the world. Obviously, they're not all available at your local home and garden center or through catalogs online, but that gives you an idea of what we're dealing with on the grand scheme of varieties. And it, they're originally from South America, but over time, through genetic mutation and through crossbreeding, now they're growing all over the world, and a lot of them are more acclimated to different temperatures and different climates. Now you may hear about genetically modified crops or potatoes. Some There are some of those available on the market. You are not going to be able to purchase those at your garden center or independent or, or online catalog because the big biotech companies require the big ag farmers or those who grow genetically modified crops or GMOs to sign contracts in which there's a lot of agreements and a lot of stuff that goes on there. So you're never going to be able to buy one or plant one because they're not going to ask you to sign something with a whole lot of legality to it. So you don't have to worry about that. It's just uh, you're going to be able to buy certified organic seed potatoes no matter where you go to find them. Now there are some potato growing myths. One is that you cannot grow store-bought potatoes. And this is not true. Now you may not be able to regrow a, a conventional growing potato, but if you buy organic potatoes, you can regrow those. Many of the potatoes in which you purchase from your big box grocery store are sprayed with what is called a growth inhibitor, and that is a chemical that greatly slows down the production or the sprouts or the eyes, as we'll talk about in a moment, on your potato, so it's more appealing to the buyer, to the grocery store uh, consumer, and it has a better, longer shelf life. So that's why many times you're not going to find potatoes that are non-organic sprouting. There are a couple of different varieties of potatoes, just like there are tomatoes. There's determinate and indeterminate varieties of, of potatoes. And just like tomatoes, the determinate variety is going to grow to a certain point, and then that will be it. It'll just produce as many potatoes as is allowed in the plant, and, and that will be the end of it. And the indeterminate variety is the long season or the late season potatoes, and those continue to grow throughout the season, giving you more of a harvest. And on the screen, on the lower portion of the screen, indicates some varieties in which are a longer variety and indeterminate variety of potatoes. So when we talk about varieties of indeterminate and determinate varieties, there are what is said to be garden myths. Now, has any of you attempted to perform any of the growing techniques that are on the screen right now, whether box, uh, tire, or uh, cage? Okay, any of you have any success with any of those to the stature that you would, okay, some people have some success. With our experience, what we have found is that none of these are as successful as regular putting them in the ground or in a container. The image on the left of the screen, which is the box of the two by, the two, by two, four foot tall box, you're supposed to be able to do that and grow 100 pounds of potatoes in it. Well, through the gardening community on YouTube and other individuals whom we spoke to, this was a article that got a little blown out of proportion. The Initial, initial person who posted this got 100 pounds of potatoes out of that box, but what they failed to indicate before putting it on social media and becoming clickbait is on the next slide, you'll see what we're talking about. On the right-hand side, they planted one row of potatoes, they began to sprout, then they put more soil on it and planted another row on top of that in which you had potatoes throughout the box. So, so the myth is, is that instead of doing the two different rows separately, you plant two rows together 
and then you're gonna get them all to grow phenomenally, and that's simply not true. And that's not what's usually told when you find this information online. So it's not that simple. It is possible, but you have to do two different plantings. The, the, the thought process is that stock will continue to grow as we're all told to backfill or cover the stock up, and more root development will occur, which will occur more tubers. And we just simply have never found that in our garden to be true at all. So in our experience, yes, this may work for some people. You can try to modify as if you choose to, but for the most part, growing them in a container or the ground is what's gonna get you the most yield or even a straw bale. And growing in tires is not advisable for really any vegetable. Though there has been studies that prove there's no leaching out of the chemicals into the soil, it's a preference that you have to make for your own garden and for those who are consuming the food in which you grow those uh, crops out of. So. What are you going, to, what, what potatoes are you going to plant? Well, it really determines what's the end result of what are you going to use the potatoes for. So if you're going to use it for roasting, baking, freezing, mashing, canning, maybe there's a specific variety you enjoy to eat. Maybe there's something that you, you feel is more beneficial to you, and that's how you're going to determine what you want to grow. When you go purchase potatoes at your garden center or online, they have a description about the potato and it does indicate good for canning or good for cooking. If your intentions are to can these, pressure can these, don't buy a potato that it says not good for canning or doesn't mention that. Let uh, use, you know, be rational about this and buy the potato not because of the prettiness of it, but for the functionality of it uh, and the end result of what your intentions are. So we use potatoes that are certified seed potatoes from a farm from uh, Bridgewater, Maine. They're a family farm that's been in operation for 41 years. And the nice thing, uh, there's 26 specialty variety potatoes. They sell it every year. We've never got a bad potato or bad seed potato from them. And the nice thing about that farm is the, the mom and dad are passing the farm down to their children and uh, continuing the generation of farming. And they're all certified non-GMO and they're very anti-GMO in that manner. So you can get your seed potatoes from online catalogs, independent garden centers. Uh, that's just where we choose to grow them. So there's, th there's three types of potatoes when it comes to when you're going to plant them or how long they take to grow. And there's the early season, which is about 75 to 90 days. There's the mid season, which is about 95 to 110 days and the late season, which is the 120 to 135 days. Now, we are, we've played around with uh, the days and the planting. We are able to get an early crop in at the normal time about mid, early, late April, early May. And then once the garlic comes out, we are able to put another crop in of uh, mid varieties and get a late fall crop. That, that worked very well last year and we'll continue to practice and finesse our numbers to where we can have several harvesting of potatoes all summer long. Now, chitting the potatoes, let's talk about this. This is a way in order to speed up the development of the potato tuber, and you can do it a couple of different ways. So one way you can do that is you just allow them to start their sprouts naturally. You wanna keep them out of direct sunlight in about a room temperature room, and then just keep them separate from each other. So you can use an egg carton or even like a seed tray and you want to do this about six weeks before planting. Now, by putting it in the corner in the ambient light, we don't want to undergrow lights or direct sunlight. By the time that six weeks has elapsed, you will have about an, maybe at best an inch sprout on that potato. And that's simply just to increase the uh, speed in which the potato will root in the ground and the sooner you can get potatoes. And is it necessary to chit your potatoes? Um, no, it's not. It just it does give your potatoes a chance to kind of get a jump start, uh, jump start on the growth, but it doesn't make a difference. If you do live in a shorter season area, maybe more in northern Wisconsin, then you could chit your potatoes and you would have a, a faster season. There is a number of commercial growers that just simply take a potato and throw it in the ground and it grows just fine. So it's not something that's required, but we do it in order to help speed up and for the next reason uh, in a moment to get more seed potatoes out of uh, each potato. And so this just talks about um, whether you, when the sprouts get really long, whether or not you want to cut trim them back or to let them grow and you just want to let them keep growing, you don't want to cut them back. The tuber itself is the energy source in which the new plant will emerge from and grow. 
So by removing those sprouts, and I'm talking ones that are on the lower right-hand side of the screen that are one or two inches, you want to leave those alone. Now, if you have, though we've all had that. We found them in the cupboard, and they're like 16 feet long, and they're all, yeah. Uh, those those were, were just start over. But with these, um, I would remove the one on the right-hand side and leave the two on the left-hand side and plant that potato as is to allow two stalks to emerge and grow properly. What happens when you snap those off, the energy in the tuber, if it's large enough, it has to go through a recovery process to regenerate that growth and slows down the, the, the speed of the plant developing and the harvest, but also can reduce the size and, and uh, the health of the uh, potato as well. So you can cut your seed potatoes if, you, if it's large enough and you have more than one sprout. You don't want to cut them smaller than the size of about a, a regular size chicken egg. So as you can see here, you have a three ounce potato. You don't want to cut that. And then all the way to a 10 ounce or larger potato, you could get four pieces. But you just want to make sure each piece has an eye or a sprout on it. Now, you don't have to cut them, as we indicated earlier. You can simply throw them in the ground. But this is an advantage to increase the number of plants that you'll have in your garden or your containers. Studies have shown whether you plant the whole potato or you cut it up and divide it, the yield is the same either way. You're not losing or gaining any additional yield per plant. What you're gaining is additional plants in order to make your row fill out better or get more in each row or container. So that's, that's a way that we can stretch the dollar of the seed potatoes in which we have purchased. Now when you do this, you want to make sure you let them sit for a day or two before you plant them so they get the nice scab over the cut portion. But you can also sulfur, do a, an agricultural sulfur on them, which is called dusting. We don't do this, but some people do. And you, you can dust them with sulfur the day if you're cutting it and planting it today. You can do that right now. Uh, just leaving it over that two or three day period will callus over and kind of put a hard shell just like a wound that you would have on your arm and really prevents a lot of diseases, insects, bugs from per, uh, burrowing in and eating the inside of your potato, which decreases the number of potatoes that you grow because the, the bugs have ate it. So that's what we do, and either way, is, it works fine. So now you're ready to plant your potatoes. So you need to think about when and where you want to plant them. And so the key is you want to have full sun, and that means about 6 to 12 hours of sun per day. You want to make sure that when you plant your potatoes that you have a minimum soil temperature of 45 degrees. That doesn't mean 45 degrees ambient air temperature. That means if you take a thermometer, put it into the, the soil a couple inches down, and then that soil is 45 degrees. Uh, 50 degrees is the best temperature to start with. We've done 45 for the last several years, worked very well. And to acquire that temperature, uh, the ordinary meat thermometer out of the kitchen works very well. It's usually about a minimum of six inches in, in uh, thickness. You can shove it in and get a good root temperature, uh, root zone temperature. Just make sure you clean it before you give it back to your wife and, and she uses it for something else. But it works very well. You get an instant reading and you know what, is, what it's at. But again, ambient temperature means nothing. Many vegetables across the board that you're planting, it all revolves around that root zone at temperature, whether or not the plant's going to succeed or not. So when to plant and where to plant, well, we obviously we want well-draining soil, whether it's in the ground or in a container. We want to avoid heavy clay soil because that dense soil will hamper the development or the, the largeness of the tubers. And you want to plant two weeks before your last average frost date. And you can find that by talking to your local extension office or just going to your favorite search engine and typing in last average frost date, insert your zip code there. And that's an average over the last 10 years of calculations. If you're concerned about the pH, you can do a pH test, send it to the local university for a, a small uh, fee, and you can get detailed uh, information whether you need to add or take away or what you need to do to increase the fertility of the soil. But 4865 is the optimal range. Most gardens are about 6572, somewhere in that range, uh, for, for a general uh, understanding of what pH is and, and where some people are setting at. So we talked about the time to plant, but you just want to make sure you have a nice loose and loomy soil for your potatoes. Full sun, again, as much as you can give it, uh, preferably. Organic matter is important. We, we're going to talk about the fertile, fer, fertilize that it, fertilizer that is required to help increase the uh, benefits of the potato. But if you can continue to pour good organic matter into your garden, your raised beds, your containers, that is obviously a good thing. Dry grass clippings, upper, right, up, upper left corner. We use certified leaf compost, upper right. 
dry grass, uh, clip, or, uh, uh, shredded leaves, dry leaves. We try to capture all the leaves in the fall on both sides of the house and across the street. And the neighbors are more than happy to put them in the street for us, as well as use coffee grounds will also increase the fertilization of your garden. Uh, coffee grounds are 2% 2, 2 nitrogen and 0.2% uh, Pota uh, phosphorus and 0.7% potassium, and you can purchase, you don't have to purchase them, you can get them at your local coffee shop, just call ahead, they are more than happy to allow you to bring a bucket in, fill it within a day, and they're happy to see it go because it's not going to the landfill, and you mix it in to your garden. Uh, I would go about a pound every two or three square feet, and you can kind of play with that based on how much you might, uh, how bad the soil is and what you're trying to accomplish. So the best weather for your potatoes would be where the daytime temperatures are about 60 to 65 degrees, and then at night after, uh, below 57 degrees. This is not always possible, but that is the ideal temperature for potato growing conditions. That is what the book says would be perfect if we had the world that we could control but it's not, so uh, when the weather is hot, the top of the plants can uh, re uh, re wilt and, and not produce very well. Uh, we don't have to worry about this in um, Wisconsin that much, but in other southern states, if the soil temperature reaches 85 degrees Fahrenheit, the plant will, it, it dies off. Uh, I've never seen 85 degree soil, so we don't have to worry about that here, but there are some states in which that is a concern. And the biggest potato uh, producing state is Idaho, and they have cool summers and, and nights, and that's why they are one of the leading producers of potatoes in the country, because they have optimal soil and great temperatures. And so when you're putting your potatoes in the ground, you want to plant them about, we plant ours about six to eight inches down into the soil and about nine to 12 inches apart. Now on the screen there on the right, on the left hand side, it's a traditional trench method, six inches deep. The eyes are pointing up on the potato. That seems common sense, but you, some people get excited and just throw them in the ground, and you gotta have your, the eyes pointing skyward, otherwise they don't grow that well. The center picture, and the, uh, the center picture is, I went ahead and created the furrows like we're all familiar with, the healing up process. Then I went through with a post hole digger and simply dug down six inches and dropped potatoes in each hole experimented with it, worked very well, and then just re-healed up on the right-hand side of the screen. Both produced fairly well potatoes. So either way, you know, it's how much work you want to put into it is what it comes down to. So now we're going to talk about the fertilization or the fertilizer that is needed for your potatoes and what is recommended. So you want to get a fertilizer with a higher potassium and phosphorus. Uh, Numbers, numbers um, compared to the nitrogen content. That, that is the, the second and third number on your fertilizer bag. Nitrogen is always the first. And then later in the season, you can fertilize them again. We haven't done this, but we're gonna, we are going to try it this summer to see if it makes a difference. And you can just use an all-purpose uh, organic fertilizer or inorganic fertilizer based on your growing beliefs. Uh, whenever you get to that organic fertilizer, Basically, most plants won't pick up more than a 555 uh, in that range. 5 to 9 is about your average organic level. When you see the fertilizers, the triple 15 or the triple 20, those are synthetic fertilizers because there's no such thing as those type of numbers that can be organically created in nature. And then you can mix in a solid organic fertilizer. And as we mentioned, you want to check the plant mid-season if you choose to, and then add extra fertilizer if the leaves are looking slightly, like, slightly yellow or if you don't see things, seems like they're growing very well. As well as you can add compost, rotted manure. Do not use fresh manure because you will kill your plants. Most animal horse, animal manure, cow manure uh, is very high and, and has a hot nitrogen and it will just burn burn your plants up. So you want it to age for a year or put it in through a good composting process. It has great nutrients, but you have to use it when it's the appropriate time. You just can't throw it right on your garden. So this past season, we tried something called no-dig potatoes, and it, it was... Well, it, it, it worked very well. On the left-hand side of the screen, we took an experimental patch of three foot, uh, two foot wide by three foot long, added one inch of compost, as a bedding uh, material, right-hand side of the screen, I s went ahead and spaced the potatoes nine to 12 inches apart, added the requirement for the, the correct fertilizer requirements on the back of the package, and then we went ahead and covered 
the potatoes with regular leaves, dry grass, clippings, shredded paper, large yard debris, whatever we had, about 18, uh, 20 inches high. And throughout the summer, I continued to try to find materials in that range to cover them up. And they sprouted, they grew, they grew much better. These were finger link potatoes. They grew much better than the finger links we had in the ground. And when it was time to harvest, we simply just raked back the leaves, picked the potatoes up, and put them in the box and, and walked in the house with it. Worked very well, very low maintenance, and we will continue to exercise and, and try different methods of no dig uh, this coming year. And there was no weeds? There no, wasn't weeds at all. very minimal very weeds minimal. with that, uh, that procedure. So that's something that maybe if you're not a big fan of digging a lot, that might be one way to go about uh, going with a no dig method. So now we're going to talk about container gardening, and this may be a way, again, easier than to traditionally dig a trench or bury them in the ground. Now, not many people realize you can grow potatoes in a container, but it, it is very possible. So what you want to do is you want to take your container and you fill it about a third of the way with a, a good potting soil compost, and then you plant your potatoes, and then you fill it back up with the rest of the compost or soil. We're not worrying about topping it off every time the, the sprouts emerge through the ground, uh, th through the soil, because we believe that there's no, no, no proof that putting more sprouts on the stalk creates more potatoes. So that's why we uh, go about this way. So here's a rough guide of how many potatoes you can put in a grow bag container bucket. And with any device that you're growing your potatoes in, please put holes in the bottom of them because potatoes can't swim and they can't breathe underwater and they will die just like many other crops in which we grow in our garden. So one, ga one seed potato in a three gallon pot, again, here's the, the key with these containers. The larger the container, the larger the mass of soil, the more moisture is contained in that soil, the slower that will dry out. So keep that in mind. 10 gallon grow, uh, grow bag or container, three to four seed potatoes, space these evenly, and 15 gallon, five seed potatoes and, and on up. There's many grow bags. We use some 60 gallon grow bags uh, that work really well. And again, place them evenly because we have to have adequate space for the seed potatoes to grow tubers correctly. So this is a little question and answer that we have here. Uh, at the time, of, so, so, potatoes do put on flowers and they bloom. And some people say if you cut the flowers off, it's going to take energy away from the flower production and put it back into the plant. And that's not true. Cutting the flowers off is not going to make a difference in the growth of the potato. Uh, this was a big thing in the UK several years ago. And this is from the North Dakota State University Extension Office potato ex uh, specialist. So just allow them, let the bees come in, take the pollen they need to create honey, and let, enjoy, the, uh, enjoy the blooms. Many varieties bloom many different colors, and that's just some of what we've had. Now you can simply as just cut a bag of compost open and plant your potatoes in that. That's what we've done. Uh, that is a two cubic foot bag of certified leaf compost, which we slit down the side, laid on the ground, and took another two cubic foot bag and topped it off, and then simply put three seed potatoes in it and let it be. Now we do want to remember to water this, and it did work very well. And then at the end of the season, you dump your compost out, dig your, uh, pull your potatoes, and then you're, you've got, uh, you're helping increase the fertilization of the soil the next year if you're in, in a garden bed, or you can put it in a container and, and save it and use it a little bit next year. Now here, here is something, go ahead Holly, you can explain this. And then this. You'll, you'll see this on your potatoes, your potato plants by the flowers a lot of times, and those little green balls are basically seeds, they're potato seeds, and you don't want to eat those, you don't want to eat the pota potato flowers either, but if you see those, that's what they are. They're, they're true seeds, they are extremely toxic, so that's kind of a defense mechanism that the potato puts on to ward off predators from eating the top of the, the plant, but each, each, each seed contains hundreds of, each pod contains hundreds of little seeds in which there are gardeners that try to and do successfully grow those seeds into mature potato plants. It's much easier just to take the tuber from a certified seed potato, divide it and plant it, but that, you know, we all have things that we enjoy trying to experiment with and this is one of them. Not all varieties of potatoes will produce these types of seed bulbs uh, on them. So some will, some won't, and it also depends on the stress of the plant during the growing season. So again, we have to water our, our, our potatoes, it goes without saying, but we want to make sure the soil is damp, not soggy. About an inch of water a week is really a good standard to, to go by. Uh, and and if, you're really, if, if it's really a very warm summer, 
go out there, stick your finger in the soil, see if it feels damp, if it feels dry, go ahead and water it or don't water it. It's, it's uh, pretty, pretty common sense, but you know, we, we want to make sure everybody's on the same level of growing potatoes. So just like any other plant in your garden, there's a possibility for problems. And we picked three common problems that people face with potato gardening, and this one is aphids. Aphids live in a lot of places in our garden. What they do is they're basically like a tick on a human. They're sucking the lifeblood out of your plants. They're really tiny. They're usually green or yellow, sometimes black or brown in color. And if you get too many of them, they're just going to, they're gonna cause discoloration of the leaves and they're just gonna eat the green life out of your plants. Uh, suck the green life out of, uh, out of your plants. Now, these, uh, you wanna be very vigilant about this because if you do have an infestation, they can reproduce without breeding every two weeks. So things can get out of control very, very quickly, uh, whether in your garden or in a grow room uh, for that instance. And that's how we lost a whole bunch of peppers two years ago was because of aphid infestation and it just devastated everything within just a couple of days before we actually understood what was going on. And you can spray them down with a soapy diluted water and that will kill them. Or you can spray neem oil or canola oil on your plant. If you choose to use neem oil, you want to make sure that you purchase a cold-pressed neem oil. There's a lot of neem oil at your local garden center, and it's usually once they harvest the good parts of the neem oil and leave the, the bad parts. Uh, the cold pressed neem oil is how the top type, the number one press of the neem oil goes to the cosmetic industry and then the garden industry kind of gets kind of the leftovers sometimes, but there are good reputable companies out there that sell the cold pressed neem oil and that is the most effective for this type of application and controlling the aphid insect. And another problem we have is early blight. So early blight is common, it lives in your soil and it, it does affect it could affect many of the plants in your garden, but it does affect the, the nightshade family plants a little bit more. And you know you've gotten it, you'll, your leaves will turn kind of a yellow color, they'll look kind of sunken, sometimes they'll have brown spots on them. And this is just something that, if you experience a lot of rain, it's because it lives in the soil and it's splashing back onto your plants. So one thing you can do to get rid of it is to mulch around your plants, or not necessarily get rid of it, but help prevent it, because when you mulch around your plants, it helps the rain or the water from splashing back onto your plants. Also, based on the type of variety of potato you're growing, some are more susceptible to early blight than others. We found that all of our fingerlink potatoes last year were susceptible and, and almost eradicated all of them. The rest of the potatoes that were growing one foot away from the other, the, the fingerlings had no effect whatsoever. So keep that in mind. Again, mulching is a great deterrent. Also, like tomatoes uh, and potato growing, we also apply some yellow whole grain cornmeal, which has a beneficial bacteria in it, trichoderma, trica, trica that helps fight that bad bacteria, which is the early blight in your soil. And that seems to greatly reduce. It doesn't prevent 100%, but greatly reduces that, uh, that spores from splashing up and affecting your plant. And then we have late blight, and unfortunately this, this does happen. It's what happened to us last year to our tomato plants very late in the season. And you'll know you get it because the leaves all of a sudden start turning really brown and get really brittle. And late blight is an airborne disease, so if you do get late blight on any of your plants, you don't want to put them in your compost, you don't want to give them to the city, you just want to simply throw them in the trash. There are some copper fungicides that are a preventive measure or slows it down prior to you getting it, but you kind of have to be ahead of the game. And again, you don't want to put these in your compost pile or the municipality because if the spores are kept warm enough, which is what most compost piles do over the winter if done correctly, they can be reintroduced into your garden the following year or the municipality in which you shipped them to or gave them to the city, somebody else has picked them up, put them in their garden, and it can uh, reintroduce itself and cause more problems. So just throw them in the trash, uh, be a good gardener, and, and help other people out by not spreading diseases that uh, you're aware, of, that, that you obviously know what they are. So when, when to harvest? When is the best time to harvest your potatoes? You do not want to harvest them any sooner than 10 weeks. Once you've reached a 10 week point, you should let them grow longer, but if you want the, the new potatoes, you can harvest them then. And then you want to harvest them after the flowers have appeared and died, and generally when the growth dies back and the plants are starting to fall over, look really yellow and brown, then you know they're really ready to harvest. And the longer you let them grow, the better. 
you can harvest them early when the flowers appear, but it's not, many gardeners will say, oh, the flowers appeared, I can dig the potatoes. Your tubers are still developing until the plant gets into that third stage and, and begins to die back. You can harvest them, but you know we always wait and try to get as much out of the out of the potato as possible. Now, a good range or a good guide in what you should be getting out of your garden about for every one pound of potatoes you put in, most charts will say you should get about 10 pounds of potatoes out. Uh, that's a good range. Some people will get 12 to one or one, 12 pounds out for every one pound. Some good gardeners are getting one pound, uh, 15 pounds out for every one pound they put in. So it really determines the fertilization of your soil, the type of potato, the conditions that you're growing them in. Uh, we're still building the soil in one of our gardens and we only have a one pound in that we planted and we get 4.6 pounds out. So that was one garden we're working on. We'd like to get that, that big turnaround, uh, that 15 to one ratio. So we, once we've harvested them, we've got to store them and there's a number of ways of doing this. We choose to go 50-50, half the potatoes get stored this way and the other half we pressure can. So when you, when you harvest your potatoes before you store them, you do not want to wash them. Leaving that soil on your potatoes will help keep them from rotting faster, just kind of seals them in. And then you want to check for damaged potatoes. Any damaged potatoes, you want to keep them out of storage, just go ahead and eat them right away so that you're not putting the bad potatoes in with the good potatoes. And then you want to keep them in a cool, dry place, in a mesh bag, a wicker basket, a paper bag, a cardboard box. You don't want to put them in plastic. Now, it, many of us probably don't have root cellars, but maybe we have a concrete basement or a garage. By putting them in that cardboard box and setting them directly on the concrete, that actually helps slow down and cool down the core of that potato and just prolongs the life just a little bit longer uh, to get more life out of it. Yeah, so like a, a garage, an attic, stairs, basement. You do not want to store them in your refrigerator. If you put fresh potatoes or any potatoes in your refrigerator, it changes the sugar molecules of the potato and turn it more into a sugar as opposed to a starch. Just like you do, don't put tomatoes in the refrigerator. It doesn't end well. They taste horrible. Same thing with potatoes. So here's another question and answer that gets asked a lot. So what is a natural way to stop potatoes from sprouting in storage? You can store them with dry lavender, lavender, sage, or rosemary, and that will help slow down the sprouting of the potato. The oils in those herbs work with the chemistry of the potato to help reduce the sprouting. Not always going to prevent it 100%, but greatly slows it down so you can enjoy more of those potatoes in which you've worked hard to grow. So another one is what causes scabby potatoes and what do you do to solve this? Well, this is a soil-borne uh, organism that develops uh, and, and you can do this on a, you can do a couple things to fix this. Uh, rotate the crops, obviously, is one way and those are more resistant varieties that are on the screen above the photograph, you can grow those. Some of you may have a problem with the scabs, others uh, may have minimal. If you do have scabs on your potatoes and you want to save those for seed potatoes next year, don't do it, it's not gonna work. Uh, you're gonna cause more problems by saving them. Just peel them and uh, eat them and just buy new seed potatoes next year. And if, if, that, if you do get the scabby potatoes, what you wanna do is take that area, add some lime to it, and then leave that, that soil as it is for three years. And plant other things in that area, but then three years later you can come back and, and try the potatoes again. Well, I'm Joy Baird. And I'm Holly Baird. And we thank you for watching. Thank you for your attentiveness on, and uh, best of luck on growing potatoes in your own garden.